Thank you. Um, so forgive me in advance, I'm getting over a nasty cold, and if I cough and sniffle, excuse me. Um, and it's 2018 with a big election coming up, so I'm going to tell you what I really think. <laughs> so recently I happened across a fading old post-it tacked in an obscure corner of my office, and uh, it's a cartoon of two beetles. One is saying to the other, of course we put up with a lot of shit. We're dung beetles. <laughs> That's kind of what life is feeling like these days, isn't it? <laughs> We're charged with cleaning out the stables of a misbegotten, decaying civilization, composting it into fertility and replanting it with new growth. This is a transformative and, and traumatic moment, a time of demise and rise. We're in the maelstrom. How we navigate the pathways forward will set the course for decades and, in fact, centuries to come. Perhaps it took a breakdown this breathtakingly extreme to reveal the democracy theme park for what it is and to mobilize enough people to actually change the system devouring people and planet. In this psychotic episode of Politics Gone Feral, were grappling with an illegitimate regime. It lost the popular vote. It seized power by exploiting an electoral reality distortion field, nakedly corrupted by voter suppression, gerrymandering, and an anti-democratic electoral college. It's been doubly overwhelmed by a disinformation mass media machine and Russian black ops and cyber war. This democracy theme park is also a Potemkin village, and Putin is a Republican. <laughs> to be clear, I'm a registered independent. But with that said, I have to agree with Noam Chomsky, who said that the Republican Party is the most dangerous organization in human history. Yes. Climate change denial, environmental mass murder, a war on women, a strategy of stoking racial and ethnic hatreds and white nationalism, refugee children ripped from parents and caged in internment camps, raw power brandished to stack the Supreme Court with a hardcore party partisan, corporate hack, accused sexual assaulter, and human shield for executive immunity. It's a government by gangsters and warlords aligning globally with authoritarian regimes while erecting a banana republic here at home. The banana Republicans are pedal to the metal, dragging us full throttle into the abyss, right when time is, in the, is of the essence to floor it in the opposite direction. The US Republic is ostensibly based on the consent of the governed. I revoke my consent, how about you? As Michelle Alexander wrote, we are not the resistance. A new nation is being born. Trump is the one who's fighting it. The regime is radically out of step with the ground truth of American culture and the arc of today's diverse interdependent world. They're like the Japanese soldiers in World War II still fighting on an island who didn't know the war was over. As Friedrich Nietzsche observed, all great things must first wear terrifying and monstrous masks in order to inscribe themselves on the heart of humanity. As Naomi Klein sees it, the reason the mask has fallen off and we're now witnessing undisguised corporate rule is not because these corporations felt all powerful, it's because they were panicked. Our movements are starting to win. Rather than risk the possibility of further progress after decades of privatizing the state in bits and pieces, they decided to just go for the government itself. It's a corporate takeover. But make no mistake, Trump is just a babbling hood ornament on the Hummer of plutocracy gone off-road. <laughs> the 2008 financial crash outraged the public and stoked serious talk of nationalizing the banks. It spawned the Occupy movement, the Fight for 15, a surging fossil fuel divestment movement, and mass social movements all over the world committed to toppling political corruption, social injustices, and austerity schemes that further concentrate wealth and distribute poverty. The imperative now is to convert these movements into systemic change. 
At the core, this maelstrom is a literal maelstrom, the death throes of a patriarchy hell-bent on retaining its power. Peak toxic masculinity is a distress signal. It's on the run. In the US, for the first time, women comprise a majority of the workforce. Of the 15 job categories predicted to grow in the next day, decade, only two are primarily male. Women comprise a majority in colleges and professional schools. They're gaining ascendancy in many professional careers. Record numbers of women are running for office this year, and they will win. We know that wherever women have decision-making power, all the metrics improve dramatically. States that have improved the status of women are, as a rule, healthier, wealthier, less corrupt, and more democratic. They're less likely to engage in conflict, both domestically and internationally. The physical security of women directly correlates with national security. Ending violence against women is literally a national and global security issue. This is the moment for men everywhere to put the equality, safety, and leadership of women front and center. It's high time to redefine masculinity and begin healing the gender wound with truth and reconciliation. The future of the world depends on it. As, as Heather McGee said here last year at Bioneers, our democracy has become as unequal as our economy. Capitalism is writing the rules for democracy instead of the other way around. For three generations now, politicians have stoked white anxiety, successfully linking government to undeserving minorities and gaining support from white voters for cutbacks in public spending, regulation, and public solutions. Heather's conclusion is this. We need a we to survive, and that's exactly what racism destroys. The proximity of so much difference will finally force us to admit our common humanity. The beauty is in who we're becoming. It's the country's fulfillment and salvation. Author Pankaj Mishra recently observed that just like today, in the late 19th century, an unprecedented wave of corporate globalization caused massive global migrations and racial mixing. Like today, mass social movements erupted worldwide to resist empire and its elites. As Mishra describes, for fearful ruling classes, political order depended on forging an alliance between rich and powerful whites and those rendered superfluous by industrial capitalism. Exclusion or degradation of non-white peoples was a way of securing dignity for those marginalized by economic and technological shifts. Today, Mishra continues, it has reached its final and most desperate phase with existential fears about endangered white power feverishly circulating once again. Global capitalism has promised to build a colorblind world through economic integration, but as revolts erupt against globalization, politicians and pundits in the Anglosphere are again scrambling to rebuild political communities around what W.E. Du Bois in 1910 identified as the new religion of whiteness, the ownership of the earth forever and ever. The religion of whiteness increasingly represents a suicide cult. The, the suicide cult of the US regime is a desperate white lash against a society inexorably on its way to becoming a majority minority population. It's a cultural revolution of pluralism that cannot be turned back. As Jose Antonio Vargas puts it, this country is only going to get blacker, browner, more Asian, and gayer. Women, <laughs> women will break all barriers. A country that's barely dealt with the black and white issue is now getting more complicated with all these othered people. What's left is the question of how much change can white men and white people take? But the biggest change we're facing is climate change. Over the past couple of years, Mother Nature stopped knocking and just blew the doors off. Climate resilience is about to become the central organizing principle for everyone's lives. The climate swerve of US public opinion is finally tipping. 
The markets have spoken. The age of renewables is unstoppable, promising $26 trillion in growth and 65 million new jobs by 2030. As climate chaos keeps worsening and fast forward, the shift will radically accelerate. But as Bill McKibben points out, climate change is a timed test and we are failing. We need to take bolder, bigger, and more holistic measures. It means the reinvention of everything. Perhaps the single biggest breakthrough initiative underway is Project Drawdown, founded by our friend Paul Hawken. Its goal is to actually reverse global warming by drawing carbon out of the atmosphere back to pre-industrial levels. All the practices and technologies documented in the best-selling book, the Drawdown book, are already commonly available, economically viable, and scientifically proven. But Project Drawdown's true power lies in its holistic approach that goes beyond the imperatives of clean energy technologies and keeping the oil in the ground. Eight of the top 20 solutions it showcases relate to changing the food system. Combining reduced food waste and a plant-rich diet, the numbers three and four solutions would make them number one. Combining girls' education and family planning, the number six and seven solutions would comprise the second top solution. These examples illustrate the kinds of systemic dynamics that will both reverse atmospheric CO2 and improve virtually all areas of life. It's eminently doable with what we already know and have. In just one year, drawdown projects have spontaneously ignited around the world from the grassroots to the canopy. Paul says the goal is for drawdown projects to be common practice worldwide within 15 years. It shows how we can realize a radically different scenario, healing the climate and ourselves. Realistically, government is the only force big enough to stand up to the corporate juggernaut. And the government is us if we take it back. What we need government to do today is a Green New Deal. The same battle over corporate state capture that's playing out now took place in the 1930s when FDR saved capitalism from the capitalists with the New Deal. The parallels are striking, extreme inequality and wealth concentration, wholesale deregulation, corporatized courts, restrictive immigration policy, and the rise of white nationalism and fascism. But there's one really big difference. As the late Tom Hayden pointed out, the great work then was to save us from the depression. The great work today is to save us from climate catastrophe and the end of civilization as we know it. We need to put every person in this country and on this planet who's out of a job or underemployed into that great green employment project. The starting point is to combine the notions of reducing emissions and achieving jobs and environmental justice. At the time it was being built, it wasn't called the New Deal. It was called the movement. The programs and models percolated, up, percolated from the bottom up from the laboratories of democracy, cities, and states. That same scenario is recurring today with green blocks and regional and bioregional green alliances among cities and states. Cities consume over two-thirds of the world's energy and account for more than 70% of CO2 emissions. We know that real wealth creation is based on replenishing natural systems and restoring our built environment, especially our infrastructure and cities. It's based on investing in our communities and our workforce. Restoration is estimated to become a $100 trillion market. Every dollar that we spend on pre-disaster risk management saves $7 in later losses. One key to building resilience is greater decentralization against the inevitable failure of centralized systems. Think decentralized power grids and more localized food sheds and economies. Localized economies are the kryptonite of global markets. Some of today's most innovative and successful models are arising from the work of the Democracy Collaborative, co-founded by Gar Alperowitz, who will share some of those stories later this morning. The Democracy Collaborative is demonstrating what a pluralist commonwealth could look like. It marks the end of the growth economy and the start of living within our planetary means. It supersedes, thanks. 
It supersedes the false binary of capitalism and socialism, instead creating a mixed economy in service to the common good, climate action, and equity. It devolves substantial political and decision-making power to local and regional entities, coupled with designing genuinely democratic governance structures. It prioritizes economic security and intergenerational wealth creation. At the core is distributed ownership through diverse forms of public, private, cooperative, and common ownership. These kinds of objectives may be closer than they appear. This is the time to seed the field. Small changes can have very big influences. One driving force will be the epic generational shift underway in the US and around the world. Numerous credible polls consistently reveal that US millennials and Gen Xers, the biggest generations in our history, have large majorities holding overwhelmingly progressive views. They're also more than 40% non-white, the highest share of any adult generation. By margins of 60 to 80%, young people want climate action, support same-sex marriage, recognize racial discrimination as the main barrier to African Americans' progress, and believe immigrants strengthen the country. 65% 65% believe the country is on the wrong path, 71% want a third party, and 51% oppose capitalism. <laughs> Young people, thank you. <laughs> Millennial and Gen X voters will likely be the single biggest cohort in the 2020 elections. Along with women and communities of color, their activism will change every institution in our society in the foreseeable future. As the deep ecologist and Buddhist scholar Joanna Macy puts it, we're part of a vast global movement, the epical transition from empire to earth democracy. Which brings us back to dung beetles. Over the past few years, scientists have discovered that dung beetles have many gifts. They're not to be poo-pooed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Had to do it. <laughs> These humble creatures fare, face fierce competition for this black gold. The male beetle plunges furiously into the mosh pit, rapidly piecing together bits of dung into a round ball. He rolls it away, full tilt boogie in the straightest possible line of escape to avoid dungway robbery. <laughs> now it's no mean feat to stay on the straight and narrow because the beetle is pushing that ball facing backwards and upside down, head towards the ground. How do they do it? Researchers noticed an odd phenomenon. If the beetle seemed to lose his way, he climbed on top of the ball, performed an energetic circular dance, and then rolled right along. By manipulating the time of day, scientists learned that he's recording a mental snapshot of the sun, moon, or stars. If he gets lost, he calls up that beetle maps snapshot and gets right back on track. As one scientist commented, we love working with the beetles. No matter what we do to them, they just keep on rolling. <laughs> so, pioneers, Perhaps in these times, we can learn some dung beetle medicine. If we lose our way, just climb on top of that ball, dance by the light of the heavens, and keep on rolling. Thank you. Thank you very much.